Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern and we pick one vendor or the solution that we review independently and we always have an expert panel that is willing to share their insights and wisdom. For today, we have a very exciting solution and that is going to be Salesforce Commerce. And Phil likes to call it big dog and they really are big dog of this place. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. I am going to start with my intro. I am Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP uh, and digital transformation consulting firm. We help our clients uh, with uh, any sort of ERP selection, uh, e-commerce uh, engagements. And on that note, I am going to move to Phil for his intro. Hello, everybody. Phil Kerper with Ringling Business Solutions. We help executive leadership teams align their digital transformation investments with their core business and really maximize results. And in this day and age, the investments are larger and the risks are higher. So uh, make sure if it's if it's not Ringling Business, it's Sam or one of these other guys, have someone get in there and help you make sure you're aligning and maximizing your investment. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Phil. Robert, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Sure. My name is Robert Brown. I'm principal of Robert Brown e-commerce consultancy. Um, I spent 20 years in the fortune 50 e-commerce world, and now I'm bringing that talent to the small to medium sized business, helping them understand um, the questions that they don't ask and the things that they don't see that are going to blind sign them. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Robert. And um, before we start with the session, if you're in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your comments and questions. We typically try to cover them during the show. If you cannot get to them during the show, then our panelists are going to make sure that you receive your answers. On that note, I am going to start with the quick briefing of Salesforce Commerce, how they started, what their journey has been. Uh, and then after that, we'll go through the slides. So overall, from the positioning perspective, Salesforce Commerce is positioned in the enterprise space. It is not really the SMB solution. Uh, they don't like to target SMB at all. So uh, this is going to be really the enterprise solution. Now, overall, from the product perspective, obviously, Salesforce is very new in the commerce game. They got into this roughly in 2016 when they acquired a company called Demandware. And we are going to be discussing details about that as well. The founder has had a really interesting journey. Um, so we are going to have a lot of fun uh, you know, going through that. Uh, but Demandware is where they got their B2C capabilities. And then they acquired another company. Uh, called Cloud Craze, and that's where they got B2B capabilities. And uh, Cloud Craze, my understanding is that they used to be one of their ISVs, uh, and they really acquired them. Uh, Demandware, not so much, I guess. They were sort of the collaborator, not really the ISV ISV uh, on their ecosystem. Uh, and the reason for that is because B2B and B2C commerce are very different the way they work. And this is where I'm going to have a comment on recent announcement of Shopify as well. I don't know whether you guys followed it or not, but Shopify is trying to develop the B2B capabilities. And uh, I don't know if they are trying to do this as part of the same product. If you try to do this as part of the same product, it's probably going to appear all over the place uh, because the B2B object model typically is very different from B2C in general. So overall, I think I like Salesforce strategy, the way they have done this, the, both of the products are kind of different, okay? They are not really together. Obviously, if companies want to implement both B2B, B2C and B2B2C, and Phil probably going to have some, some comment there in terms of how the integration journey goes uh, in general, but these are going to be very different product and very different experiences. 
when you are going to be implementing them so i don't know phil do you want to do you have any sort of you know commentary analysis there yeah i i i was a little different track but as far as b2c versus b2b i think you'll get it more into you know those two products i think it is versus shopify which is trying to take something that's known for b2c and trying to add to it to make it b2b i do agree that's a that's a harder road versus acquiring two products that are more uh grew up in those spaces and then integrating them with the rest of salesforce products but as a general level of experience with salesforce the it the the platforms they have is great or the modules they have is great the service cloud the commerce cloud the crm i mean is what they're really known for forever but they do a lot of acquisitions, Pardot, other things. They're bringing all these acquisitions on. And the integration is a journey that's sometimes not ready for prime time. And it's hard to get a straight answer out when you're when you're in the planning and choosing. And they say everything's going to integrate seamlessly. That's not always necessarily true with all the different uh, things that Salesforce will tell you. And I'll also say just as part of the opening volley, Sam, Salesforce promotes professional selling technique and they read their own books and they watch their own videos. These guys know how to sell. They're not going to show up without an objective. They're going to, they're going to qualify you and they're always going to try to sell you that next product. And that you said enterprise, they can get pricey and they're pricey a little bit to start with, but they really get pricey when you start adding on all the extra things that are awesome. And the next thing you know, you're looking at it, you're going, holy cow, look where I started and look at what my annual licensing is now. Just make sure you plan for the cost ahead, uh, especially if you're a mid-sized company and not a very large company. Okay, amazing commentary there. Thank you so much, Phil, for that. Uh, Robert, do uh, you have any comments? I, I'm just gonna add on to what Phil said, you know, um, Salesforce loves to sell their professional services. They are a very complex tool um, and they have a lot of throughput in terms of their employees. And so when you get new guys in the sales team, they may not fully understand the product. They may commit to things that they don't fully understand. And so it's on the purchaser's shoulders to fully understand exactly what they need versus what the pretty bauble may entice them to purchase. And <clears throat> so, you know, you can go in there and take a look at all the great things that they say they can do, but you really have to nail them down as to, uh, is this vaporware? Is this wishware? Can you actually deliver this today? Where is it on the development timeline? And do we really need it right now? So many projects go off the rails by continually adding scope creep. And, and I'll add one more comment, uh, kind of off to the side lane on on on, on those great comments in yours, Sam. The, the, these are implementations, right? This, this is not this is not a small project. Yep. And the uh, I mean, it's not ERP, but it's a real implement. It's a real IT implementation, and so. You have to make sure you go in with a lot of planning, a lot of good due diligence, a good project management team, a good team that's going to gather around what the what, as Robert said, what you really need, what's critical to your business functionality, like you'd like to talk about on ERP, Sam, and what maybe they're offering, what may not be critical as you're choosing whether it's Salesforce or the other commerce clouds and as you're implementing, because these projects are real live big projects and therefore they can get into real life trouble if they're not well managed. I'm going to add one thing to that. I think these are really programs because there's so many moving pieces. So it's very easily, you've got web development, you've got CRM, you've got backend database, you've got IT infrastructure. There's, there is a lot going on there and 1 PM will not be able to effectively handle that. Yeah, guys, so great comments. And I will add more colors there overall in terms of the product positioning. So one of the things that we like to do here is going to be compare all of the products that we have reviewed and where these guys are uh, in the value chain. So number one, the reason why Salesforce acquired uh, Demandware is going to be because they were actually trying to get into the headless journey. Uh, and Demandware overall Salesforce commerce right now, if you actually look at them, they have far more advanced capabilities 
on the headless side. But uh, make a note of this is that, you know, their headless capabilities are going to be limited to the B2C space. Okay, for the B2B product, the headless capabilities are not going to be as robust. Now, I am going to sort of ask a question, uh, you know, to you guys and to the audience. And this is my perception, to be honest. And the reason why Salesforce is, is approaching it this way. So when you talk about headless journey, everybody is going to talk about, you know what, everybody needs to be headless. Okay, <laughs> but I'm not too sure about that. Okay, for B2C, it does make sense. For B2B, to be the experience is not going to be as consumerized so i don't know if you really need that customized experience to be honest okay so and that's why probably salesforce took this strategy that you know what for b2b the the challenges are different because the the challenges are going to be more with respect to the data model more with respect to how the the transactions are going to be processed the the main problem is going to be more in the transactional processing as opposed to providing that experience that you are going to have in the B2C space. So I kind of like this strategy, the way Salesforce approach this market because the B2B product is not going to be as customizable, okay? B2C product is going to be extremely customizable, okay? The way your uh, commerce tools is going to be or any other uh, headless products, VTEX uh, that we have reviewed, uh, they are super customizable. You know, you can develop as uh, you like uh, you know, based on your React framework or the components that you're going to get. Now, uh, you know, when we reviewed VTEX, we had very specific components available when you were trying to create this composable commerce experience. Salesforce has very unique functionality for specific industries, okay? I did not see that in the case of VTEX. Obviously, Commerce Tools, Spriker, they are probably not going to have that, okay? But I still did not see those components the way VTEX had. So if you look at the overall uh, headless experience, VTEX had far richer headless experience than what you are going to get with Salesforce. So in my mind, okay, where Salesforce Commerce is positioned, okay, it's going to be slightly more ahead from your uh, SAP Hybris, Oracle ATGs uh, of the world, because you can get a little customizable experience at least in the B2C product, okay? But it's not going to be as customizable as your VTEX or uh, your commerce tools. Uh, Spriker is sort of uh, sitting in between. They are trying to promote the idea of headless in the B2B space. That's my understanding of their product. But I don't even know if you need headless for B2B too well. So I kind of like Salesforce strategy. Any comments? I can take those or... Yeah, I'll, I'll, Robert, I didn't see you, you went. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. I, you know, headless is interesting. And honestly, I'm still kind of figuring out where that really fits, you know, because it seemed to me there was so much inertia to just make it more standardized, more complete package, more easier to implement, more, uh, you know, uh, ready to go API in, interactions with partners or apps that were in their ecosystem. So it was almost like make this easy to implement was the direction. And headless came along or that concept started to get more talk. And it's like, well, make it interesting and make it unique and make it fun and do best in breed and really be able to put your your front end package together. So I think I don't think it's one or the other. I think there's a lane for both those concepts, just as the non-technical person trying to think about it from a business standpoint. But I do agree with what you're saying on the difference between B2C and B2B, how B2B seems to favor much more you know, it, packages that are built for an industry or for a segment or for a way to market philosophy so that you're already got that all ready to go on. Then your, your, your uh, configuration of that, not customization of that is just making it your own versus headless where you really can, you know, do a lot of development and a lot of customization. The Robert? biggest, the biggest challenge that I have seen is executive teams buy in very quickly to the sales pitch from Salesforce. Salesforce will show, you know, customers that have adopted their product um, and help executives believe that it's just an easy implementation. And this is where the executive team really needs to talk to the project management team and the IT team to make sure that they have the resources and the bandwidth necessary to effectively implement this product. 
because yeah. really at the end of the day, anything can be implemented if you have the money and the resources necessary to get it done. Unfortunately, there's, there is frequently a disconnect between the, you know, pretty bauble yep. and the cost to do that. Well, and I'll even take that more refined. I think this is a really important point. If, 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 and this is nothing against any functional team in an organization. They all have to be great to win and there's great people in all of them. But if you allow the selling part of your organization to dictate all the bells and whistles that is on your commerce platform, you're going to end up with a lot of functionality that may be difficult to manage through, difficult to implement, difficult to maintain. And you might not have really put the stuff that you really care about on top as a priority and stuck with it. And Salesforce, God love them, will help your sales guy with that functional creep all day long. They'll just they'll keep shoveling more great ideas for that sales team to say that they want. Or or provide them the ROI on the investment to sell it to the executive committee for the, those change controls. And, you know, at the end of the day, that still doesn't deal with the underlying implementation team and, and operations team that actually has to make this work. And, and, I, and I'll put a final final point on this one, uh, guys. You know, you got to have a really good parking lot strategy with the ideation that's going to happen early in these projects and have a good optimization strategy on the back end because stuff that people say they really want and is really important, and this is very similar to ERP, they really want this and they're just passionate about it. And you say, okay, that's not in scope this phase. You know, we're going to put that in a parking lot and we're going to have an optimization phase after the initial go live, even if it's not MVP, even if it's a real robust go live. Nine times out of 10, that's not what they want in 12 months anyway. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you mm -hmm. saved yourself so much hassle and wasted time and money on something that once they see the see how it works, they say, oh, well, what I really want is this, which has nothing to do with what their wish list was. So you got to have strong leadership to say, what are we really going to do on that first phase? And what are we going to put on the back burner and come back to to see if that still matters? You know what? That that is that is a great point really at the end of the day really what everybody wants is they want to be able to deliver something that they can say they won at right and that's where communication between the teams actually comes into play and that parking lot strategy is so dead on okay guys so uh let's cover some of these slides uh so here uh obviously this is the demand wear product that i was talking about this is the b2c uh, Salesforce Commerce, as we call it today. Uh, this was the demand where um, acquisition that Salesforce had acquired. And the interesting thing about this product is going to be the founder came from a product called Intershop. Okay. And if you have been in the e-commerce space for any length of time, you would probably recognize that product as well. Okay. That is still around, by the way. Okay. So Intershop is around. The founder sold demand where to Salesforce. He started another company called New Store. Okay, and that is also around. So this founder is on fire. Okay, and both all three products are really compelling products, and probably they are competing with each other at this point of time, to be honest. <laughs> okay, so that's how crazy his journey has been. But obviously, the way he has created the product, they were one of the best. No questions about that. So here, Demandware uh, is a software technology company, uh, you know, headquartered in uh, Massachusetts, and. Uh, provides a cloud-based unified e-commerce platform uh, with certain features, but they have positioned it for the B2B and B2C retailers. But the whole idea of Demandware was that they wanted to create this customizable experience. And that's why Salesforce actually went after these guys as well, because uh, when Salesforce did not have Demandware, Headless wasn't there. At that time, the e-commerce experience was either go you go for something like Oracle ATG, or SAP Hybris, uh, you know, that they are going to be super clunky. You require the backend technologies to be able to customize. And it's going to be a very massive project, IT project, and that marketers are not going to have any control on. So this is sort of, uh, you know, in between where you have a lot of control, uh, but you still have the customizability that you are looking for uh, from the marketing uh, standpoint, if you look at it from the perspective of a marketer. Um, so that's why 
this whole notion of headless as well as demand where was very powerful that's why salesforce was really uh salesforce wanted to get into this game so they acquired this in what 2016 uh and uh the we have some more comments here it says the service was launched in the first quarter of 2005 so it was a very quick growth from 2005 to 2016 11 years massive exit uh you know one company as soon as he left into shop this is uh, commendable, guys. I mean, this is this is powerful. Okay, so obviously he knows what he is doing, uh, and uh, here the commentary reads that Demandware uh, began trading on. So it was a public company raising roughly what eighty-eight billion uh, dollars uh, uh, in that IPO. What else do I have here? And uh, they had roughly what six fifty-seven percent growth uh from 2006 to 2011 that's how crazy it was guys so it was super hot when uh, salesforce acquired it uh in my understanding is going to be salesforce commerce is even harder right now uh you know people really like uh salesforce commerce yeah i mean that that's like you say that guy is really a, a sophisticated first of all he knows what he's doing on creating product but he also knows what he's doing on growing and how to turn it over you know, he, he, if you read the details on that slide, he, he managed that IPO. He had a broker involved at the right time. He ended up getting, you know, taking an $88 million number and turning into, you know, two and a half billion, three billion or three, six. I think I saw it crazy. Numbers. Yeah. Really, that guy really is smart. Very smart. Exactly. And that's why I like the B2C aspect of Salesforce Commerce, to be honest. Okay. I am not too sure about the B2B one. Uh, we'll review that as well. And that is the code base. If you actually look at the data model, the code base, it almost appears as if it is written by an ISD or a VAR, uh, you know, in the enterprise software ecosystem. So the data model does not seem as uh, clean. The product does not seem as clean. The experience is not going to be as clean. But B2C commerce is a real product. It's, it's awesome. I, I absolutely love it, the demandware product. Okay, so some more commentary here. So here they are saying they were targeting companies that want e-commerce sites in a hurry. And that's true as well. Okay, before this, e-commerce meant, okay, three-year-long project with no visibility whether that project is going to be successful or not. So here we are talking about faster implementation, faster, uh, you know, to the market. But at the same time, you are still going to have that customizability that you would want uh, in your e-commerce sites. So they are saying that e-commerce sites in a hurry, but don't want to set up the software themselves or settle for for um, cookie cutter me to look. Uh, you are still going to have me to work with most platforms, to be honest. But in this particular case, at least you had some flexibility. Um, then uh, some more comments. Uh, by the way, the customer count, if you look at, so they had, what, 200 customers at the end of first quarter of 2014. So as such, the customer count wasn't as high. And Phil, now you can tell, now if you look compare this with, Spriker, Spriker had 200 customers. Okay, now you know why they have billion dollar valuation uh, because of these acquisitions. So, okay, so something is going to happen to those companies as well. Somebody is going to grab them because SAP has, uh, you know, they really need that headless experience. Oracle needs headless experience or they are going to lose in the commerce game. So Salesforce is obviously going to win, uh, you know, against these guys. So they are going to be uh, captured by one of these, these companies. Um, so obviously they had really giant customers and that's where the, the whole, uh, you know, value came from of this solution, uh, they held L'Oreal, uh, you know, Hallmark and Deckers, right? So that's where I guess they had really high value overall. Now, this is the, the, the power of this platform, to be honest. Okay. So when you look at the Einstein and the rule-based engine, and based on that, you are releasing the recommendation, uh, on the product. I don't think we have seen this kind of customizability of the AI platform anywhere else. So recommendation engine is, is one place where it's going to have the real power, especially in the B2C space. When we reviewed commerce tools, when we reviewed BTAX, uh, when we reviewed Spryker, I just didn't see that it was as friendly overall in the recommendation engine. And this is what I absolutely admire. Uh, the way you can create these rule engine based on the preference, based on the the attributes of your customers, and then you are going to be doing upselling and cross-selling. I don't know if any other platform can do 
this kind of custom rule. And, and that's what I really appreciate about B2C commerce, um, Salesforce B2C commerce. Okay, now this is very, very, very unique. Okay, this is something that I have not seen with any other platform so far and Salesforce. And this is, uh, you know, something that we have seen with a lot of different platforms, Phil, that e-commerce platforms are getting a lot more ERP capabilities. And that is probably going to be a trend, okay, as e-commerce capabilities advance. So e-commerce uh, platforms have very different object model they are going to have some more data sets that can never reside uh, inside your ERP. But overall, that pre-sales and sales layer is becoming far thicker, and it's going to be even thicker as we move into headless experience, as metaverse, you know, becomes bigger. I don't know how big that is going to get, okay? But that is nuts, okay? The kind of valuation that investors are saying that uh, metaverse is going to get, then that's where the value of headless is going to be. And that's where that, that service layer is going to be really thick. In that service layer, you are going to have many different data sources. And probably that's how the headless commerce is trying to uh, position at this point of time. Headless commerce only talk about the, the commerce data. But in my mind, this is the plain service centric or service oriented architecture where you are going to get multiple data, data sets, not just commerce. So commerce is going to have your cart, your recommendations, your catalog, these are your commerce data sets. But then you are going to have your financial data sets. You are going to have your supply chain data sets. You are going to have your industry 4.0 data sets, right? So I don't know whether that is all going to be sourced as part of the headless commerce layer, or this is going to be just a data source feeding to your service layer and then that going to your content platform so overall the architecture is going to be very interesting the way this is going to be shape up so here salesforce has very specific functionality for certain industries okay that we have not seen anywhere else and that will require much heavier lift in the customization of these platforms if we want to build these capabilities because these capabilities require data model changes okay and that is always the hardest to pull off in any platform. If you are looking for simply UI changes, that's easy. Anybody can do that. But when you are going to be looking at <clears throat> additional data model or additional data elements or the life cycle of data, okay, that's where the real trick is. So here we are talking about the grocery market. In this particular case, uh, you know, they are talking about omnichannel in inventory across hundreds of stores and thousands of SKUs. Again, when you talk about grocery delivery across Omni-channel right now, it's very, very, very tricky to implement. I don't know how many companies really have that. Uh, the only companies that are going to have the omni-channel inventory is probably going to be very enterprise companies, and they all have the custom platform. Okay, I don't know if any of the platforms can really support that out of the box. So that's where uh, this functionality is already built up. So that itself is a huge saving. Then you are going to have privacy tools. We saw privacy tools in case of your uh, SAP Hybris. Uh, that's a very enterprise-centric functionality when you are talking about GDPR compliance from your marketing perspective. Uh, you know, if you are going to have all of those issues, then your platform needs to support that. Now, your commerce tools, et cetera, I don't think they are going to be able to support all of this functionality. Now, that requires your data model change, okay? So that's a very key piece of functionality. Uh, then we have, uh, again, the Einstein is a great piece of functionality. Uh, I don't know how many companies can really match that Einstein piece that is really, really, uh, you know, powerful with Salesforce. So here we are talking about predictive sort, product recommendations, commerce insights, search uh, dictionaries, uh, and then search recommendations. Uh, and then they also have the Salesforce order management. I'm not too sure if I like that, to be honest. Uh, okay, so this is where the it's going to get really tricky whether you are going to manage your order inside your um, inside your CRM platform or are you going to manage inside your ERP platform. In some companies, okay, for example, let's say if you look at telco industry, they have already started managing all of that as part of your CRM platform. And the reason for that is because it becomes extremely tricky to manage inside ERP. So again, that whole CRM layer is becoming extremely thick, okay? I have seen this in case of medical device as well. So I don't know, uh, you know, how the archit future architecture is going to be. If CRM is going to get far more functionality, e-commerce is going to get far more ERP functionality. 
but this is overall a very interesting trend especially in certain industries where this that whole pre-sales and, and sales workflow is very complex and and that's and that whole topic both both how the data structure is as you talk about and where the functionality lives is dynamic it's a moving target and 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 definitely clients that I've worked with in, in the last months have been grappling with this. And it really does, it takes, I'll say two things about it. First of all, it takes an open mind. If you had asked me a question a year, year and a half ago, well, where should be the source of truth on something or where should some key piece of functionality live? I would immediately said there. That may not still be true. You got to go in there with an open mind and really look at the products and what and what the process flows really are to get those decisions correct. So it's an open mind. And the other thing is draw it out, draw the stack out and really think about it. You know, you make make good, solid pictures of this thing and challenge it of how the process flows are going to work, how the workflows are going to work and, and, and eventually how the APIs are going to have to work. What I've seen, Sam, and maybe you've seen this too, or maybe you have a comment on this, is that a lot of the complexities that were, you know, either in, in add-ons in, an, in a mainframe AES 400 environment or on the cloud infrastructure products right now, it could be warehouse management, it could be uh, the content uh, uh, management piece or the ERP piece, all of a sudden those are moving closer to the front end of the business. Well, now the core products still got to talk to those. So now the, this interface and this interaction between these I see companies writing a lot of middleware and coming up with a lot of different strategies or uh, data lake or other data strategies to manage this thing. Maybe you have some more detail technically on that. I see it from the business and the project management side. It's complicated and it really needs a good discussion. So the comment I'm going to have on that is going to be, it's very, very, very hard to find one person or a couple of people who are going to understand all of these technologies. Typically, everybody tries to drive architecture in their direction. And that's where most of the transformation really fail because nobody really understands, okay, what is going to happen uh, if you talk about the overarching picture, right? So that's where I see a lot of challenges when you are talking about these big, large transformation, nobody has that end-to-end -end visibility. So to your comment that, okay, you really need to draw it out and drawing it out, meaning sometimes that could be a two year long project just to draw it out, okay? <laughs> but that's definitely required if you really want to have your architecture to work. And when you are talking about these massive components part of your architecture where your processes are all over the place, okay, spend a lot more time in drawing those out and really challenge as you feel correctly pointed out. Right. And it will be a, di and it's not, and it's not a finished product. That drawing and that, yeah. that those diagrams are going to constantly evolve. Uh, I, I, I had a client that I, that I worked with last year a little bit and and they showed me their current state of, of IT and what they wanted to do. And I said, well, where's the picture of future state? And they said, there is no way I have time to draw that. Yep. I'm too busy implementing. And I and the analogy I had is a car going down the road 80 miles an hour and so concerned about getting to the next town, they really have not opened the map and trying to figure out where are they actually driving the car to. But it's a real problem. They really didn't have time to think about all of the what this thing really was going to be. So now it evolves and you end up building the complex uh, legacy systems that were built on prem. Now you're just building a complex ecosystem that's not on prem, but it's still cobbled together if you don't think these through. It's a, this is a really hard point. And I think you just got to work on it really hard and realize you're not going to get all the way there, but you're going to be a lot better off than if you just start putting these pieces in place and then figuring out afterwards how they're all going to work together. Yeah, we, you know, we've been talking about this um, actually for many of the episodes. It's, you know, at the point that somebody is going to implement this, they're they're in a transitional phase for their company, right? It's it's not just like, oh, we're just going to get rid of this. They're, they're trying to achieve some goal. And, you know, do they have the data maturity to achieve their goals? And very often, these companies are running way too lean to have that future state, let alone the, the current state, and understand, you know, if I want to deliver X, where is the data that's going to support that? Where is the infrastructure that's going to provide that data? And they haven't looked at that. And they may not even be capturing that data or know where it is. 
And, you know, so that's where having an appropriate implementation team and analyst team to, you know, tell you, okay, we don't even have this. We have to implement part A before we can even begin this project so we can actually deliver the project the data that they need to be successful. Yeah, great points, guys. Um, so now we are going to look at the the some of the other industries. So here we have uh, you know industries such as communications and media, and again different beast guys. Okay, if you look at their pre-sales process, the kind of product offerings they have, it just uh, it it's very different, and that's probably the reason why they were not traditionally more of the ERP industries. Okay, so they always had this custom software for their operations and they were simply relying for financials for ERP. And now Salesforce is doing a lot of that inside their platform. So if you look at functionality such as registered user browse, uh, you know, cart, basket, order creation, uh, submission operations, then anonymous browse and cart operations, some of this might be available in platforms such as Magento. Uh, but again, the way their processes are going to be, because their, uh, you know, the user journey is going to be far thicker, the way user uh, engages with your brand, the way user is going to be engaging with your channels. And the kind of offerings you are going to have here, you are looking at the subscription-based offering, offerings. It's not just buy and sell. Okay, uh, you know, I am buying a product, so I have the credit card, that's it, I'm done. Move on. <laughs> this is going to be far thicker overall from the engagement perspective. And also your the way your product offerings are going to be delivered, it's going to be a very different experience. Then they are talking about new mobile uh, equipment purchase, which is again, very thick functionality. Uh, you know, then they are talking about new postpaid and prepaid mobile plan activation. Guys, and I don't know, uh, I think Robert, you have uh, some experience in the insurance space. When you look at the insurance marketplace, the way the buyers and sellers interact, it's just a nightmare, okay? You are not going to find a platform that is going to support all of that interaction, uh, you know, in the insurance industry. And when you look at these prepaid and postpaid plans, the amount of layers that they have in their plans, uh, in their subscription, the way their products are structured, oh my goodness, it's very, very, very hard uh, to implement that. And those are the feature sets that Salesforce has. And that's why Salesforce is so strong. And it's favored by a lot of, uh, you know, different sales organization because it provides them, you know, what they are looking for, especially in these industries. Salesforce is really strong in communication and media, uh, insurance, healthcare, automotive. That's where uh, they, and automotive, when I say we are talking about, when you talk about that dealer relationship, Right when OEM has to control the dealer sites as well, because dealers are not going to have their own ERP. So it's a very different interaction model that they have. So that's where Salesforce is really strong. Uh, most of the ERP systems are not going to work there. Uh, so Salesforce, uh, you know, has created very different uh, market overall in these industries. Uh, now we are talking about some of the other feature sets, such as new bundles with, uh, you know, optional add-ons new TV plans and equipment, new OTT services, new media and entertainment services. Uh, and these are going to be the add-on services similar to what you have in the insurance space as well. So these are going to be additional services that you are going to be offering as part of your subscriptions. Um, then, uh, so product management for complex bundles with cardinality rules. And this we saw in case of your Salesforce CRM as well, uh, that they were really good at that, okay? Now, if you are going to be implementing this as part of the other vanilla platforms, it's probably not going to work. And that's where Salesforce is really strong. So that's for this one. We have some more industries. For example, let's say if you look at the insurance. Now, insurance has very deep functionality as well. For example, if you look at the whole, the way the quoting process work for insurance, it's going to be very similar to real estate. Now, you cannot really implement an ERP in the real estate unless you are implementing for finance, okay? So uh, so for the operational workflow, typically you either you had very focused ERP solutions uh, or you had uh, to customize or build custom uh, platforms to be able to support that functionality. And insurance and the banking goes through a similar process because the way your account opening process is going to be, it's very, very, very... Uh, different from your traditional commerce cycle. Uh, and that's where Salesforce is trying to build a lot of that functionality as part of your Salesforce commerce platform, as well as your Salesforce CRM. So that's why Salesforce is really powerful. Uh, now they are, 
Sales, oh. Salesforce is, is having a lot of pushback from some of the major insurance players. So there, there's like Epic and Guidewire and Duck Creek and, and Jesco and EIS. And all of them are the core insurance systems. And, you know, what they expose for the likes of Salesforce to take advantage of differs. Because some of these, these um, groups have their own e-commerce solutions and so they're they're actually bidding against the core solution versus salesforce and what they're willing to expose and what they're not but you're absolutely right the you know the the way that you create accounts in an insurance environment or a financial services environment is significantly different than the way that you do anywhere else yeah, and that becomes a very interesting play as well, because some of them are really partnering with Salesforce, but they have to sell their offerings as well. But then yep. Salesforce is trying to go deeper. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's definitely tricky. Okay, so in the case of insurance, obviously, they have very deep functionality. When you look at the, 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 the whole cart abandonment scenario, it's not going to be similar to your commerce experience. Uh, it's going to be very different the way the the experience works because in their case uh if you are going to leave the card then you actually get a call from a person uh you know i don't think if you are selling five dollar widget phil i don't think you can afford to have a call center person who's going to call hey i got four five dollar product for you uh i don't think you are going to have margins to do that right and it's regulated you have to have a broker to, to buy an exactly. actual product right so so that has to be in that process Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so that's a very unique process. And that's where Salesforce Commerce and the Salesforce CRM uh, really shines. So we have a lot of different layers. And again, none of the commerce platforms can really match that. So let's say if you're implementing this for your insurance industry, this could be a powerful uh, you know, tool, especially if you're going to be in that upper to uh, enterprise range. Uh, if you're pure enterprise, then probably you want to develop your own custom software. I don't know if you want to implement something like Salesforce, uh, but this is definitely, let's say if you are in one to, I don't know, $10 million range, then this is a great play in my mind. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, that I experienced specifically with Salesforce is their team came in and created a proof of concept to show, you know, hey, these are the pages that we could build very quickly. This is the kind of data that, you know, we, we could deliver for you. This is the kind of experience that we could deliver. And it took them maybe 20 days for their team to come in there and, and, and create that proof of concept. What they didn't explain, and, and we have been you know, hammering this home, is the truth in integration. Yeah. Actually getting that real data to actually have a live experience. And, you know, it's it looks really great on, on the top level. You know, hey, 20 days, that you know, you've got three guys, you deliver this really cool proof of concept. It looks really great, you know, but when you've got this big behemoth of a back end that you got to connect to that, that turns into a completely different story. Yeah, completely agree, guys. And that's why they have MuleSoft. But again, MuleSoft is not going to solve your problems unless you have that, uh, you know, as a state and, and the future state that Phil was trying to describe. First, you need to draw. And if you are not able to draw, think of 10x complexity when you are going to actually implement it. Okay, and when you are going to be implementing something that you don't even know whether that is going to work or not, good luck with that implementation. You are going to have a lot of fun as a CEO or the executive. And MuleSoft is awesome, awesome software, but you better also you also need an IT team. Yep. That 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 knows what they're doing on APIs. Exactly. Exactly, guys. And and MuleSoft is another one where you're getting married. So <laughs> and the licensing fees are not cheap on that on that product either. And once you're once you're once you're there, it's hard to unwind. If you've built your if you've built your uh, uh, API infrastructure uh, middleware on MuleSoft, you're kind of you're a MuleSoft house at that point. It's very different to go in a different direction, right, Sam? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, guys. So some more things related to automotive. So here, automotive is not really the automotive manufacturing. This is a very different interaction, and this is going to be between your OEM and dealers. And that place is very, very, very different. Okay. Only Salesforce can probably do that if you are going to be enabling websites for your dealers. And obviously, the dealers need to have very powerful websites as well. Otherwise, cars are not going to sell. Okay. So that's where you <laughs> you really require that powerful platform, and that's where Salesforce Commerce can can really shine none of your other vendors will be able to play in that space. Uh, and that's where it, it's really powerful uh, in my mind. Uh, then we have some of the consumer goods. I did not see much of the differentiation 
to be honest, for the consumer goods and manufacturing. Uh, I don't know if you are going to find as much differentiation. There might be some things uh, from the Einstein perspective, from the curbside selling, curbside uh, pickup, as well as guided selling. But overall, in the commerce ecosystem, you are going to find a lot of options. But if you look at insurance, uh, automotive, uh, you look at communications and media and grocery, that's where the power of Salesforce is in my mind. Um, okay, some more industries, healthcare. Healthcare is big for Salesforce and they have very deep, thick functionality that you are probably going to require as part of your CRM as well as your commerce layer. So in this particular case, for commerce, they have a lot of different uh, you know, layers. For example, let's say if you look at the contract-based group purchasing organization pricing, so providers can negotiate discounts and other savings based on purchasing volume. Now, that's a very thick workflow, the way it's going to work, the interaction. So we are talking about many different personas that is are actually interacting with your commerce layer, and you need to accommodate that. So that's a very thick functionality that they have. Uh, then obviously, the, any of the HIPAA requirements are going to be extremely tricky as well. Uh, not many platforms can really support that. Uh, you talk about appointment scheduling. Uh, when you talk about scheduling with doctors and the patients, that's a different ball game altogether. Uh, okay, you need to be you need to be super sure about what you are doing. Uh, otherwise, you can be in real trouble. Uh, I don't know if there are going to be any sort of regulatory compliance there, uh, but that functionality is extremely tricky, uh, and they have far deeper functionality overall for that. Um, what else am I looking at at the healthcare? Uh, and the whole community aspect, I guess, you know, that is very strong for Salesforce. That's why they have been trying to pitch uh, Slack a lot uh, for, for that as well. So healthcare is where uh, they have a lot of different communities, patient communities, and the whole interaction piece, they can make a lot of money there. Uh, then you have things like flash sales. I have not seen this anywhere else. The flash sale is going to increase the volume significantly. In fact, they are recommending some of these strategies to manage your workload that you are going to get because of your flash sale, uh, you know, but the volume that you are going to get, the unpredictable volume, uh, it's it's really hard to manage, okay? So you need a lot of different planning there. Even for Salesforce, it's going to be hard and Salesforce is trying to position that, okay, they have functionality for flash sale out of the box. Now, this is the B2B uh, you know, model. And in the case of B2B, you are going to look at a lot of different data objects that are created on top of your Salesforce platform. So this is really the way that I have this platform in my mind is, OK, you have the core data model of Salesforce, which is extremely rich for any of the CRM functionality. It is one of the richest data model that you are going to find in the CRM space. And on top of that, the Cloudflare team had developed more uh, objects and we have some of the, the pictures of the data model, what all they had to extend to support B2B functionality and how thick it really gets. So in the case of B2B, the whole idea is going to be really complexity of the interaction of your data model as well as the objects. And here we are not talking about just your commerce data objects. We are talking about cart, search, Person, promotion, personalization, okay? So that's a very commerce functionality. Now that data is not going to reside in your ERP, okay? So that's where the real trick is in this B2B. And by the way, I did not see any configurator functionality, to be honest, okay? So if you are looking for configurator for manufacturing, okay, Salesforce CPQ can do some of that, but it's not going to be the same experience that some of the other platforms that we have in the market might be able to do that. So again, you know, it is a very thick workflow, but not sure if it is going to work for everybody uh, in the B2B space. Now, this is the data model extension. And if you look at the amount of depth that the data model has, for example, if you look at this, if you compare this from the B2B data model, obviously, uh, you know, if you look at the ERP or any other commerce platform, they are probably going to have account, they might have contact, uh, you know, they might have users as well. Uh, but then when you look at the account group, that's where the complexity comes, okay? So a lot of platforms might not be able to support that. Then we are talking about, you know, account settings, account address book, uh, storefront association, community, okay? Then we are talking about contact address. By the way, community is going to be part of your Salesforce CRM. So Salesforce CRM data model is sort of, you know, marrying with your commerce data model, and that's where the real power is. And then when you look at the... Uh, this is the cloud craze, uh, you know, data model 
and this is going to be for the product. So in case of our product as well, you are going to have a lot more data elements that a lot of e-commerce platforms uh, are not going to have. For example, let's say if you look at the subprod terms, I18N, okay, <laughs> you are probably not going to find that. Uh, product spec index, uh, subprod item, not many of them, okay? Maybe Magento has, uh, but again, this is a very rich data model. Uh, when you talk about category, in case of category as well, in the case of media and telecommunication, they are going to require very deep and thick data model that your, uh, you know, vanilla e-commerce platform can never support that. So that's where the power of Salesforce Commerce is. Uh, now, let's look at some of the card data. And again, this data is never going to reside inside your ERP. This is a very commerce data set. So this is where the power of headless is going to be. And you talk about payment, price group, in case of price group as well. And, you know, this price group is not really your ERP price group. You have to have your price group inside your e-commerce layer as well. Because if you are going to be providing that omni-channel experience, you need to have that because some of the data elements are probably not going to reside in your ERP. So you need that as well. So here you have the price group, price group item, you have the group account, uh, and some of these accounts might not even reside inside ERP. So again, that's where the, the, the click is overall in these two data models. Uh, but obviously the integration is going to be the trickiest part when you are going to be integrating this data model with your backend systems, as Robert had pointed out, that's the, the, the hardest part. Two, two points on that. First of all, on price list, Sam, it, it uh, to implement front end like this, both B2B, C, B2B, and then also have a back end ERP process that can also manage pricing because you have to be, you have to have a source of truth when it comes down to billing, right? Yeah. It, it, it also can create, you have uh, the company and the client having to relook at the way their price structure is in the first place so that they, they you know, maybe they're not using a list price with, with discount multipliers. Maybe they have, you know, maybe they got dozens of price lists for different customers or discounted price lists. If you can reform that, you can make this problem of where does the uh, where how does price go between the platforms yeah. easier. But it takes a rethinking of your pricing strategy and how those lists work. And the customer is the same way. The, the, the ERP needs to be able to accept an order from a first time customer that it doesn't have a record of. And that whole process there, that workflow there, it's common. You know, anybody who's done ERP has done it. But you've got a lot of functionality here where you've got a you've got an account here that maybe is or in your C, uh, CRM system. And once they buy something, they become a customer. That whole loop needs to be thought about on how that gets managed from a workflow standpoint. I could not agree more, guys. And it gets really difficult when you're mapping out those workflows. It's not easy at all when you're mapping those states and, and the complex workflows uh, between accounts and the, the order states. So guys, this is the experience, the B2B experience. When you are going to be looking at the, the site, it's going to be, be very similar to how we saw in case of Spryker, to be honest, okay? That is probably going to be the closest comparison that I'm going to have uh, for this platform. Uh, you have similar functionality as quick order. In their case, uh, you could literally you know, copy and paste uh, SKU number, comma, your quantity, and then you could create the order. So those are some of the workflows that you are probably going to be needing as part of your B2B workflow. Uh, here, uh, Salesforce can support some of the uh, subscription plans as well as part of your B2B product. I don't know if uh, the products that we have reviewed so far, they can support that. So that's a, probably a unique uh, piece of functionality. But overall, if you look at the experience, you are not going to feel this is really headless experience. This is a very uh, similar to how other platforms are doing this. Now, this is where the, the difference between headless versus uh, your uh, your legacy platform is going to be filled. So in this particular case, let's say if you want to make any sort of modal changes, okay, so you are going to back, back to your code, you are compiling that, and then you will be able to make the change, okay? But let's say if you were doing this in, in the headless platform, then you can do that right inside your, you know, plain text editor, and then you can promote that in your browser, and that's how different the experience is going to be, even for the developer. So if you look at the total development time, just to test very minor feature. So in the case of legacy platform, let's say if it takes half an hour to test one feature, that's your developer time. In case of headless, it's probably going to take five minutes. So that's the real difference between when you are building these customization. And here we are talking about simple modal changes, okay? So when you are going to be doing this in case of your B2B piece inside Salesforce, that's going to be much easier. B2B, much harder because it's not headless. 
so this is another uh, this is their um, uh, the CMS uh, component and it looks very lean to be honest from the CMS perspective uh, it's not as rich and this is what we saw in case of Oracle ATG as well as SAP Hybris because they want you to go through the whole development flow because it's very thick Java based development you know <laughs> so it takes a lot of time to develop those uh, Go, that UI, obviously you have customizability because you have developers, they can do whatever you want, uh, but the experience is going to be very different. So that's pretty much it. And we didn't have any sort of, uh, you know, red flags on the reviews. To be honest, the only thing I could notice is going to be, let's say if you're very small, obviously you are going to feel the platform is extremely bulky, which is natural. If you are, uh, you know, 20 people shop, 50 people shop, why would you implement Salesforce Commerce? It doesn't make any sense. Go for something like Shopify Big Commerce. But if you are really a uh, decent size, uh, size shop, maybe you are hitting a billion dollar, that's where probably Salesforce Commerce is probably going to make sense. All right, so I'm actually going to stop and open it for the commentary, guys. Well, really good review, Sam. Nice job tonight. I... I... The, the, it is, you know, I, I call these guys the big dog, and and we just talked about one lane that they're in. We didn't get into service cloud. You touched a little on CRM, but their their uh, their ecosystem is absolutely amazing. There's a reason that they're just about printing money. There's a reason if you go visit them in San Francisco that uh, with their annual uh, um, get together, you know, send some of your people there if you're a Salesforce house. They'll get a lot out of it. These guys are amazing. But you got to make sure. I think you highlighted it well, and Robert hit it as well. This is not for everybody. It's not. It's not for SME. It, it may not even be for medium to larger mid markets. You're getting a lot of capability here. You're going to be making a lot of investment. And I really liked. I thought that their depth in particular verticals was smart. And I did like the fact that they were trying to go down that road of saying, if you're in this vertical, we have, you know, groceries, for example, the first one you did, we really understand the grocery business. I thought that was really smart. Yeah, agreed. Robert? I, I think um, the review that you highlighted just nails it right on the head for this. And it just reinforces what Phil was saying. Um, quote, it works smoothly, but I would think that we would have preferred to have something simpler. You know, you really need to know your organization and what you're capable of handling and what your objective is before you go pick a tool. And I think for, for enterprise level companies, um, there are some that swear by Salesforce and they will be happy with this tool no matter what they do. And, you know, for many enterprise, they can implement some segments of it. It's just a matter of what your shop is using and what you need to uh, accomplish. Yeah, could not agree more, guys. And one more comment that I wanted to make based on the comments that were made during the show, and that is going to be when you look at these different products, and Phil, I think you pointed out that you are going to be looking at many different products. The way Salesforce works is very different than when you are going to be working with the other vendors. And their pricing is going to be very different as well. So some products are going to be based on your GMB. Some products are going to be based on your user seat. And tying that together and calculating your total ROI, it's, I'm not even talking about ROI. I'm talking about total amount that you are paying to Salesforce. Okay, yeah, even computing that. Yeah, trying to get a decent total cost of ownership for whatever period of time. And, and the, I'm glad you brought that point up at the end. It's not just that it's hard to get one of them understood. They, and they're doing this on purpose. Uh, you know, someone may send me a note saying I'm wrong, but these companies are doing it. They're making it convoluted. So if you if you actually want to have four different companies and get them all to the end and say what's the best for me on features and what's my comparative total cost of ownership, their pricing strategy is so convoluted. It it makes you it's hard to do. It literally will wear you out trying to figure out what it's really going to cost you especially as you're scaling your business, which you probably are if you're in making these investments in the first place. So have the accountants involved too. You know, <laughs> and, and the scary part about that is there's, there's two components to this, this cost structure. There's the components that you, the, the VIG that you're paying to the SaaS, right? So you're going to be paying a percentage to Salesforce and say your insurance provider and, and all the other guys, but then there's their IT support group. And, you know, many companies 
when we hit an economic downturn, start laying some folks off. And it's those IT folks that you need to keep this thing running. So that's another really good point. It's it it it's it, it and we're about to come into us uh, uh, you know high potential for recession right after coming out of a, a explosion in e-commerce investment, especially in the B 2 C space, especially in certain verticals that had a lot of home type products. And so if you if you're sending people home that are that are IT related or that are focused on maintaining the, even if they're not IT, even if they're in your sales and marketing group, but they're running the back end of these platforms for you and keeping everything fresh and alive and moving forward. If you cut there, you're going to, you're going to get, you're going to feel that pain. Unlike you would have in the past. That's a great point. All right, guys. So we are close to our time. We can take some more short comments. Otherwise you need to close. Good one tonight, Sam. It was good. Okay, amazing guys. So that's a wrap. And again, if you are in the enterprise place, this could be a great platform, especially for those industries where they're really strong. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one vendor or the solution that we review independently. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another solution. Uh, on that note, thanks everyone for your time and insights tonight. Good night all. Thanks everybody.